there is a certain provocation in the title of our conference. I suppose that is one way to view it. Another would be to think of it as an aspirant declaration, an attempt to draw us towards some way of viewing the Caribbean as a nation or as nation. Surely, though, such a declaration has to be understood as provocative given, the imp given how impossible it is to deny the fact that the Caribbean is a space in which multiple nations have been formed and have doggedly resisted geopolitical unity. There are many archipelagos around the world, and while there exist some that have managed to resist the call to unify, the peculiar history of the Caribbean region has made geopolitical unity something that has eluded us. Islands lend themselves to isolation, of course, and the physical layout of the region has made it difficult for easy unity through communication to be affected. I've tried to trace exactly when we stopped talking about West Indianness and, for instance, West Indian literature and began to speak of Caribbean literature. Because you know that's happened, right? Yes. So I don't know when it happened, but I'm interested <laughs> in that. And it's hard to nail this thing down. After all, the term Caribbean literature has existed as an aspirant one for many years. The West Indies as a conceptual space was, as str was so strikingly a product of the colonial enterprise of the British and such an e entomologically uh, crazy term. It was fr frankly an error um, that it would make sense that a poet of Brathwaite's sensibilities and sensitivities, notwithstanding his passion for cricket, um, would have been inclined to celebrate a term that contained in it all the rich possibilities of the poetic. A sea named after the earliest inhabitants of these islands, the Caribs, that defied all the impositions of colonial and imperial rule by the very root of resistance found in the people after whom the space was named, gave much more to the poets than the mercantile construct called the West Indies. In the 70s and 80s, West Indies cricket was dominant in the world. The success of the team gave us a reason to think of ourselves, at least in some ways, as a nation. That the West Indies were beating the colonial power Britain at its own game meant that as a statement of resistance, West Indian had currency. As a result, all the work that was being done in literary scholarship in defining West Indian literature was not going to be undermined by anything. Our critics were clear about the label, the West Indian novel and its background, the making of the West Indies, jazz and the West Indian novel, and so on and so forth. At the university and in high school, when I was in high school, we were studying West Indian history. We were also studying West Indian literature. The term meant something definitive. It presented a clear paradigm that made sense to us and apparently to those outside of the West Indies who read our work. I have a provocative view which may have no basis in fact, that the idea of the West Indies as the Caribbean owes much to the United States government under the presidency of Ronald Reagan, whose administration coined the phrase the Caribbean Basin Initiative, which represented an extremely cynical and quite aggressive effort to establish a series of initiatives, tariffs, and additional laws aimed at making illegal any aid to <laughs> groups or governments in the region who had a clear or even tangential leftist leaning. These included many of the Caribbean islands and, of course, many Central American nations touched by the Caribbean Sea. And quite quickly, the term Caribbean in reference to the region became ubiquitous, largely because of the powerful broadcast strength of CNN through its far-reaching and defining satellite presence. Where before many European countries gave special breaks to English -speaking, the English-speaking region, the Basin Initiative did away with those, and consequently it became necessary for the islands of the Caribbean region to join forces in an attempt to articulate positions vis-a-vis -vis American dominance. And this was compounded by the way in which the quite lucrative and far-reaching drug trade was also co-opting islands in the Caribbean with no regard to language differences. Finally, the West Indies began to lose, and we were all all starting to talk about the Caribbean. And I mean the West Indies cricket <coughs> team began to lose. So I really think that's where it happened. This is my proposition. And that change, it's an interesting way in which the kind of um, 
oppressive force or the, 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 the neo-colonial mm -hmm. force begins to make the colonized have to redefine itself and its own language to resist mm. that, to create a kind of unity to resist that force, right? It's the way that blacks became blacks in Britain. Everybody joined the black black because you, the more people get black, then you have more people to fight. You know, that's why, that's why even the one drop rule in America, while mm. it is problematic, profoundly problematic, African Americans embrace the one drop rule as a as a way to get more people involved mm. to fight to fight the, the, the oppressive white system. So so oppression builds really curious alliances to fight it, right? And I think we became Caribbean kind of for that reason. Right? Now if any pushback was going to come, it would have to come from Britain. But the British were too busy defining black British identity and Afro-Caribbean identity along those lines to even make an effort to push against the demise of the West Indies. So here is the great effect of this change. In many ways, it has made more acute the fragmentation of the Caribbean sensibility by proposing a unity that is even harder to achieve than the linguistically pragmatic term West Indies, the West Indies. Because of course, the West Indies is linguistically pragmatic because of course, they all speak English. Right, but you don't have to. You don't have to deal with the Antilles. You don't have to deal with Cuba. You don't have to deal with Puerto Rico, Dominica, Haiti. God forbid. <laughs> so you don't have to deal with those. Really, you just say it's the English-speaking West Indies, right? So it's pragmatic in that sense. What with at least two major institution, in, institutions bearing the flag of the West Indian nation, and with an existing vision for a confederation of West Indian states already in the imagination of the region. Even if it had failed, if it failed, the concept of what the West Indian nation state was not foreign or unimaginable. But the Caribbean nation state, the facts on the ground make it clear that there is simply this is simply not going to happen, except in some conceptual sense, in some grand economic sense that does not derive from a society defining itself, but from a society being defined for the convenience of the dominant powers that consume that society. What we have seen happen in the decades since the West Indian Federation is greater and greater fragmentation and the rise of the Caribbean island states, distinctive, independent, adamantly so, regardless of their size. This is compounded by the fact that the larger of those nations have managed in the last 50 years to evolve quite distinctive narratives of identity and place that have emerged in the literatures and cultural practices of these regions. Some islands are simply more dominant and influential than others in the passing on of their cultural styles and identities. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Now, few can deny the power of, say, Calypso, for <laughs> instance, in shaping the identity of every single part of the Caribbean. Even with the advent of reggae and dancehall music in the 40 years after 1960, Trinidad has exported a vibrant carnival culture to Jamaica that is now entrenched <coughs> and fully a part of the idea of Jamaicanness. Jamaicans, though, know that this is an import from Trinidad and that the Trinidadians are the experts at carnival and calypso and soca and whining and all sorts of things, waving flags. All right, so um, much respect is due. Um, at the same time, few can deny the impact that reggae and rasta have had on all of the Caribbean islands. Some would like to not see that influence, but it's happened. Too bad. All right. Um, but, but here is the important truth of the matter. Nationalism is a powerful force in the Caribbean, and it is a nationalism that, in the context of the literature produced, is not predicated on a sense of collective Caribbean or even West Indian nationalism, but a nationalism rooted in the island state. And this is a fact. I think we, we, we are clear about this, and we should, we should pay attention to this. And the reason is simple. The people of the Caribbean do not live their daily lives with an engagement with the people of other islands in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. While they may recognize geographic and sometimes racial connections, they regard themselves as quite distinctive from, distinct from each other. No Barbadian would want to be mistaken for a Jamaican, <laughs> <laughs> or a Guyanese for that matter. <laughs> People from the other islands speak differently from each other, have a different sense of the world, and as far as they are concerned, and are embarked on quite a different understanding of self and place. And tellingly, America has more meaning and currency to Jamaica than does Trinidad in the minds of the average Jamaican person. And by average, I simply mean Jamaicans in general, regardless of class or economic standing. This can be said 
of Trinidadians, Bahamians, Guyanese, and Bajans. And while this should not define our understanding of a body of literature that has grown out of the same mythic rule, it should at least affect the way in which we talk about the literature and about where it is going. For there to be a Caribbean nation, it must be an invented nation. And this is where I'm getting to the heart of the matter. It must have some inherent value to those who would belong to that nation, that invention. The term narrative is thus loaded in this regard because it supposes that there may be, um, there, there may indeed be a common narrative shaping this Caribbean nation. Now, I can't accept the notion of a Caribbean nation, nor will I reject altogether the idea that in many ways, an imaginary sense of the Caribbean nation space, a kind of imaginative space or an imaginary, is not helpful to the shaping of a grounded and sustaining aesthetic. I propose this in the same way that I would propose an African poetic or an African literature, which is kind of absurd at some level, but at another level, it becomes a kind of, uh, it may be a little quixotic, but it's a useful kind of imagined yeah. sense of, of, of connection and, and unity. Um, I also propose this in the same way that I can conceive an African diasporic sensibility. In each of these instances, certain key elements operate, and here are just a few of them. First of all, those living in that space share a common mythic sense of origin, presence, and struggle for identity, albeit a historical one. For better or worse, or for worse, the colonizing ex experience with its attendant systems of slavery, indentureship, oppression, and cultural erasure has managed to grant those within the Caribbean imaginary a common sense of origin and identity. Couple that with the sense of massive migration, forced and voluntary, and pathologies of race and religion, and it becomes clear that some key commonalities exist. I think you're going to see this across the Caribbean, right? We can carry that in our heads. Two, those living in that space must share the same myth of cultural and racial identity. The myth of cultural and racial identity. In the case of the Caribbean, and by dint of the industry of colonialism, the concepts surrounding hyper-hybridity constitute truly defining commonalities in the Caribbean. It is true that the dynamics vary from nation to nation, but the principles of hybridity and the challenges and possibilities inherent in this are galvanizing forces in this Caribbean sensibility. It's something that Walcott likes to talk about, um, something that Lorna Goodison likes to talk about, the idea that we come from a big <coughs> mix-up of things, right? So, so it's, it, again, part of that, that imagined sense of connection. Number three, those living in that space must share a common relationship with the issues of language and identity. It's a common relationship. The Caribbean nations have this commonality in no uncertain terms. For each Caribbean nation, there is the fraught tension between lost languages, the vestiges of old languages becoming creolized into new languages and the decidedly complicated relationship with the language of the colonizer as the language of the societies. Issues of authority, inferiority, hybridity, and the existence of invention all exist in acute ways throughout the Caribbean space. Right? So those things <coughs> exist. So that somebody in, in Haiti and somebody in Jamaica, there's an affinity. We know this language problem, even though we can't talk to each other about it. Right? <laughs> but but, but we, we know we, have, we share this language problem. Number four, those living in that space share a common sense of geographic and spatial sense, a common sense of the spatial. While they may not be uniform across the region, considering the cases of places like Belize and Guy the Guyanas and Guyana, um, it is still safe to say that all these nations <laughs> share a dynamic and important relationship with the sea. Um, mm -hmm. That has granted them a poetic affinity that is quite important. So the idea of sea, mountains, the, that island sense um, is, 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 is also shared right across, right across these regions. Even in places like Guyana, we talk about the, the, the border of the sea, and then the Amazon, right? Creating this kind of island space and so on. Now, these are just four of the things that I'm talking about, which form the imaginary and, in, and, and constructed um, affinity across, the, across these, the, the, these islands. And I'm sure there are others. But I present them in a fairly crude attempt to demonstrate that there are so many things that make the idea of the Caribbean 
as a place of commonalities that could lend themselves or at least an imaginary sense of nationalism, one that can fire and shape the literary practices of that region. The, the, the idea then of, of embracing nation spaces it has to have both pragmatic uses politically and, and geopolitically, but it also has to have pragmatic uses in terms of the writing. And one of the things that it does in terms of the writing is that it opens up possibilities of influence to sharpen the work that, that emerges. I think it's by the expansion of those possibilities that we see the variation in the writing that is emerging out of the Caribbean. Now, because, because I think the, the rigidity of the anti-colonial gesture in, in, in the early Caribbean writing um, has been removed to some extent and has therefore given writers multiple choices of mm -hmm. other battles to fight and other angles mm -hmm. to take and so on. The emergence of women writing in the 70s and in the 80s and the dominance of those voices have changed that paradigm of just simply an anti-colonial um, battle. The emergence of writers writing about, um, about, about, about gay issues, about gay and lesbian issues, that is shifting the ways in which we pay attention to issues that relate to the Caribbean and that create the dynamic that we are seeing. And that dynamic is no longer being defined by a lockstep commitment to peasant literature or, or, or a kind of anti-colonial literature or even to a racial literature, but a, li a literature that is beginning to be more more complex and more amorphous, I think, but also quite interesting um, for, for that reason. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why I pursued this idea of the reggae aesthetic, Do, even though there was some resistance to the idea of creating a narrative of, of, of aesthetics that was rooted in, in, a, in a certain kind of nationalism. It was about Jamaican. Um, and, and was that denying, therefore, the, the Caribbean sensibility or the larger West Indian sensibility? <coughs> Hardly. But it was saying that this dynamic is an interesting one which should be pursued <coughs> to understand where it's taking its writers and where it's taking the art that is emerging out of it. The writer today is apparently liberated from the constraints of a certain kind of ideological pull, but the writer also has the privilege um, to stretch um, to, and, and the stretch of, of, of land on which to build. And that is important. There is a land on which to build. In truth, for all its problems, the idea of the Caribbean has made it increasingly possible for the contemporary writer to presume in the UK, in the US, and in Africa, and Europe, a conception of Caribbean idiom and discourse that undermines the numbing straitjacket of pure exotica. We don't have to write like Walcott, Goodison, or Césaire to be published, but it helps that their work <coughs> is known so widely. For a Jamaican writer committed to reggae as an aesthetic, the remarkable influence on reggae in the world music you know, stage is an asset, a doorway opener. But it still raises the question of what this idea of identity, what this idea of na nationality, and what this idea of the connection. I believe that the heart of it is the, in, in the imaginary space and in the aesthetic space, where we find those roots through the affinities of history and the affinities of culture and the affinities of music and language. Um, that we we find a line that connects us. It's a line that allows me to enter Haiti and Port-au-Prince, um, allows me to enter the Dominican Republic and all these other places and still find a point of uh, connection and affinity. So what I would do is end with a with a quote from um, a poem of mine called Flight. And this is, this is one of the passages in, in Flight. Heart is prophecy, frothing to the stump and rattle of the gospeler's Sunday. Heart is the word spoken deep in the stomach, so jealous, protective of my soul. Heart is my eye peering out into our collective past and finding that ancient shrine in some broken hut drawing me. I arrive a stranger, I arrive dead. Sleep never comes easy. For the trees of the mountain sanctuary rustle their hymns, calling me back, calling me back. Flux is culture. Culture is flux. We're changing inside. Thank you very much.